I don't exactly remember when I first came across Harry Potter, though I'm pretty sure I watched the second movie before I watched the first. I absolutely love the franchise and still enjoy it till this day, but I am annoyed by other people that seem to like it just a little too much. You know, just a little too much. Other than watching the movies and never actually reading the books, I also played the video game. There were a ton of them, so many that I need to specify that I'm reviewing the PC version of Sorcerer's Stone. Yes, that's what the game is called, that's what it says, I don't want to hear nothing about no philosopher. The stupid thing that people care about. Not the PS1 version, the PC version. Unlike Spider-Man that had a PC port, this has a PC version. They both share some elements, but they are different games. I'm pretty sure there was even a PS2 version, which is even more different than this. So yes, this means that we're not getting PS1 Hagrid. I am sorry. The story is obviously just the story from the movie, with a lot of bits hacked off or rearranged, but all the basics are still there. We get what we need of the backstory from this slideshow at the beginning, but keep in mind that this game is basically meant to be experienced as supplemental material. You're not supposed to play this game with no prior knowledge of the story. You're already expected to know the characters and all that jazz. That's why they can introduce Malfoy here and not before the starting hat bit. And I mean, whose first exposure to Harry Potter is going to be this game? Probably nobody's. I don't even think somebody would understand who Voldemort was if they just played this game. He isn't mentioned in the opening, and I'm pretty sure they don't mention him up until the very end, so uh... Yeah. So that's the story out of the way, how does the actual game play? First of all, the camera is always behind you, which isn't a terrible thing, but it is a very outdated way of handling a camera, even when taking into account when this game came out. At this point in gaming, way better camera systems had already existed, so what happened here? Now that being said, there really isn't a point in the game where you would need better camera controls. With a few exceptions. Now when it comes to the normal controls, we got tank controls. So you can turn left, right, move back and forward. Again, this isn't unplayable, but why these controls? Way better ways of controlling a character in a 3D space had already existed. I honestly forgot that the game controlled like this until I played it again after several years, and it did take some getting used to. My biggest problem with it, probably, is that you can't strafe left or right. Now, there isn't a lot of places where you would really need it, but it just feels unnatural. The game is pretty linear, but it tries to get off the impression that it's not. Like, if you could just run fast enough and get past that door, you could explore more of the castle. There are a lot of small secrets to be found that give off the feeling that the game is more open-ended than it actually is. I think that's a pretty good way of describing the game, actually. It gives off the illusion that there's way more there than there really is. Most licensed games don't have the best reputation when it comes to quality, so this game trying to appear deeper than it actually is, is actually a good thing. The game did feel pretty magical at the time. I think it's a combination of, of the music and the lighting. I mean, there's some really nice really nice lighting in this game. I mean, look at this. This game had no business looking this good, you know, for what it was. That's pretty good. The spell effects are also really nice and all that stuff. This just adds this nice little touch that makes it feel special. Speaking of illusions, let's get into the spells. You hold down the mouse button and Harry does his little little wand maneuver. And as you're doing that, you have a little indicator that looks really nice and, and colorful. I always like the little indicator. It's it looks nice. Also, if you have nothing to shoot your spell at, you just kind of shoot a blank out. And, uh, I don't know, I just, I just always like that for some reason. Spells are contact sensitive, meaning you can only use them in places where you're meant to use them. You don't have to try every spell in your arsenal on every wall to find the secrets. If they're there, you will find them. You learn spells from classes in which you need to trace the emblems of the spells with your mouse. Yeah, so I used to play this game a lot with my mom and, and she found out one day after like maybe like a year or two of playing this game that you can retrace what you already traced with your mouse and it still counts so if you mess up a lot you can just like redo over the stuff you already did to increase the percentage that you're gonna get so that's pretty cool i've never seen anybody else talk about that so uh yeah shout out to my mom you get four attempts in which you really only need to do the first one correctly but you will get more house points if you get all four of them right House points don't actually do anything since you will always have less house points than Slytherin, but more house points than Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw no matter what you do. Regardless though, the first spell we get is a Flipendo spell. I've always heard him say Lupendo instead of Flipendo. Sometimes I can actually hear him say Flipendo, but I think the reason why I usually hear him saying Lupendo is because he puts the emphasis on the L. He doesn't say Flipendo, he says Flipendo! 
We use it to push blocks, activate panels, and for other miscellaneous things. Next we get the Alahomora spell from Hermione. It's used to... Well, open stuff up. What else would you use it for? I mean, you can also open up mirrors, but that's like... Yeah, that, that is pretty weird, actually. People seem to think that she is the one who's giving us house points in this section, like, in-universe. But what she's doing is she's saying stuff like, Oh, if so-and-so were here, they would give you X amount of house points. Which is just the way for the game to justify you earning house points. But again, it's just... It's just a way for the game to give you house points, even though you wouldn't normally get them in that section, but we needed to give you house points. Like, it's not real. Why is that so hard for people to understand? It's pretty simple. After that, we get the classic Wingardium Leviosa spell, which is used to move blocks around. Sadly, it rarely appears after this point. Pretty underutilized. Incendio is used to deal with plant-based threats and nothing more, and the Lumos spell is used on gargoyles to make light platforms. Yeah, this one's probably the strangest one, and also the one with the fewest ways of using it, since you can only use it on gargoyles. Though to be honest, the spells that you're going to be using the most is Flipendo and Alahomora. Now since they're context sensitive, it really doesn't change the gameplay that much, it still would have been nice to see the other spells used a bit more. All the spell effects look really nice, especially Lumos, even though it's kind of hard to tell where a platform ends and begins. After learning a spell, you're put through these challenge courses where you need to use the spell to get to the end. And these challenge courses are these challenge stars that you can collect. You get them all and you get more house points. They're almost impossible for you to miss them, so you don't have to worry too much about finding them. A collectible you are going to want to keep your eye out for are the wizard cards. They're kind of like the comic books from Spider-Man 2000, but in this game if you miss one, you can't just go back and select the level again. You gotta play through the whole game again, which isn't too bad because a lot of the cards aren't that hard to find and some are practically given to you. You'll be walking minding your own business and then all of a sudden you're greeted with this. Hey Harry! Have you collected 25 beans? Beans are this game's coins and are in most chests that you'll come across. So it's pretty much impossible to not have 25 beans for Fred and George. Honestly it's really funny seeing all the places these guys get into. Also, Fred calls George Fred at one point, which is pretty funny. Never noticed that as a kid. Come on, George. We've got work to do. So some of these cards are pretty much freebies, but others are the exact opposite of that. Take this one, for example. You need to hit all three of these fire slugs in order for this platform to move. But what's the correlation between the platform moving and the fire slugs? Why would you think you would need to hit them in order for the thing to move? Another tricky one is this one right behind the greenhouse. Since you just got one from Fred and George, you're probably not going to be on the lookout for another one. Now that being said, I got most of the cards as a kid. I'm pretty sure I was just missing this guy and possibly this lady. Everybody else seems pretty familiar, so I might have just been missing those two. So the cards aren't that hard to find. We really don't get too many enemies. The main ones are these gnomes that you can run into from time to time that will steal your beans and make fun of you. The music that plays when you encounter them is still haunting to this day though. They go down in a single flipendo spell, but sometimes Harry just won't let that flipendo spell out. You'll be highlighting the little gnome and uh, just nothing will happen. And when that happens, it's really easy to get pawn shotted and it's very rage inducing. Ow. Oh, you little goblins. No, no, don't go. Open up. Ow! Stop it! Go away! But other than that, the other enemies are more like obstacles, honestly. The plants don't move, the spiky bushes can be taken out from afar, the fire slugs are just trying to live in peace, and the doxies rarely show up. Yeah! Pretty lackluster roster. The game is more about exploring and platforming than it is about combat, so I really can't give it too much crap. And maybe that's a good thing, giving the limited controls and whatnot. Of course, we also have some bosses. Mostly this kid. We fight him two times, technically. Once here, while we're trying to get out of the castle, we gotta throw the firecrackers back at him. Yeah, this this man just straight up assaults us. He won't let us leave the castle. Like, that's 100% that's illegal. The second time is here on a broomstick when he takes Neville Longbottom's remember all? Is that what it's called? I can't remember. I need a remember all. I don't have one. I can't remember what it's called. Both encounters can be done and over with really quickly if you know what you're doing. We also fight this ghost on two occasions. Both of the fights are identical, and really all you need to do is wait for an opening. Now that being said, I did find that sometimes even when the indicator was on him, the spell just wouldn't cast properly, 
It's kind of similar to the problem I had with the gnomes. So in the beginning of the game, in the tutorial level, you, you run into peeves. And uh, when I first played this game, I think I was like five years old, just turned five. Uh, peeves frightened me just so much that I had to I had to tell my mom, turn this thing off. I just can't, I can't deal with it. It's too scary. Uh, and then I went to play this SpongeBob game, which uh, I also got for that birthday. So yeah, that, that was pretty funny. Then, then I, I think I remember it was such a long time ago, so I could be making up these memories. But I, I think I felt bad for stopping playing. I was like, oh, I, I shouldn't have done that. So then I eventually like, maybe like an hour later, like went back and, and mustered through it. So yeah, it's really funny, especially since Peeves, like he's smaller than you in that section. Now these aren't exactly boss fights, they're more like gameplay switch-ups, but I didn't know where else to put them, so they're going in this section. First we have this troll chasing scene, which is exactly a copy of Crash Bandicoot. Cool little detail that I noticed while playing this game for the channel is that there's this one section where a lot of the models are on display in these glass cases, which is a, a nice little detail I never noticed uh, as a kid. And after that you fight, you fight the troll in, in parentheses. All you gotta do is you gotta spam Flipendo at the things he's... He's throwing at you, and it's very easy. And then we also have this stealth section in the game, where you gotta avoid filch. I've heard a lot of people not really like this section, but I think it's pretty fun. I think it's a nice switch up of the gameplay, and it's not too difficult. And it's not that different gameplay-wise either. All you gotta do is keep in mind where filch is when you're using your spells, and just don't run into the man. You also run into his cat, which can jump atop the bookshelves, when, you know, filch can do that, so... It makes things a little more difficult, but not that much more difficult. Both of these sections I remember fondly as a kid. Unfortunately, they're they're pretty simple uh, playing it nowadays, so, you know, kind of a bummer. Not as exciting as I remember. Before we get to the final boss, though, I wanted to talk about the stuff that's protecting this stone. First, we got Fluffy, in which you gotta put him to sleep by playing this flute. You have to put all the heads to sleep to get past, and they're constantly waking up. They also bite you. Next, we have these plants that you need to spam Incendio at. Nothing about being calm here. After that, we need to catch the key while riding a broomstick, which works exactly like a Quidditch match. Which I just realized I didn't talk about at all. You play two matches in the game. You need to follow the snitch long enough in order for this bar to fill up, and then you have a chance at actually catching it. They're very easy to do if you know how to fly, which you should know since you had a whole class on it. Here though, the space is a bit more confined, so it's a bit more difficult. Nothing terribly impossible though. Next we have this chess game, which is an actual real chess. You have to get the pieces to bump into each other to make them fight. The pieces are always moving towards you, so it's not too hard to figure out how to get them to do that. But every time you mess up, you have to watch this cutscene again, which is annoying. Next, we have this original challenge. Well, I, I think it's original. It wasn't in the movie. Was this in the book? It's just a simple keep your eye on the ball puzzle, which I somehow failed during the Let's Play. There you go. I don't think I picked that one. What? But then I could be wrong. Was it not that one? What what happened? My man died. The final boss is split into two parts. First we have this block pushing segment. Is that a puzzle? No. Like seriously, no, is that a puzzle? Raptor, no, it's nobody was arguing it's a puzzle. I just said push, push blocks. blocks. Really no, super it's fun fine. For people you, don't, is you don't have to make this a thing. Motion. You don't have stopping to make this a recurring everything. joke on the channel. Go don't away. Like I was saying, we have this block pushing segment, which is pretty easy. Quirrell will try to push the blocks back and take snipes at you. Once we get to him though, he'll calmly walk into the next room. I always found that funny. And there is where we come face to face with the big bad himself. Voldemort. Who does this for some reason. Yeah, it's an interesting interpretation of that scene. The fight involves you pushing these pillars onto Voldemort, and then when he reaches half health, you have to use the mirror to bounce his attacks back at him. Once we do that, the game is over. Yeah, sorry for not going into more detail, but this is very, very simple stuff. The biggest thing you need to worry about are these homing spells that you can get rid of but just by standing next to these things. After that though, we get this one last slideshow cutscene to wrap things up. And if you get all the wizarding cards, you get one extra scene where you get yourself as a wizard card. I never saw this as a kid since I never got all the wizard cards. After the slideshow, we get one final scene where we see what Fred and George were doing with all those beans. It's pretty funny. The music is great. It was made by the same guy who made the music for Morrowind. No, really, ain't that crazy? Before I even knew that, I was gonna compare this game to Morrowind for this review, so I feel very vindicated, yeah. The tracks really add to the atmosphere, making things feel magical, ominous, dangerous, and soothing when needed. Just like a Morrowind soundtrack. Seriously, take the track Fire Seeds and put it over footage of Morrowind and it fits perfectly. I 
and you might be able to do the same thing in reverse. Regardless of what you think of the rest of the game, the soundtrack is legitimately amazing. Go give it a listen. Overall, this game is a very primitive action platformer that, well, I don't think many people will find enjoyable today. That being said though, I have too many memories with this game to not love it even to this day. This game was essentially my Morrowind growing up. It seemed like a vast world full of magic and secrets just waiting to be discovered. And even though I found most of the secrets as a kid, I always felt like there was even more stuff out there just waiting to be found. I used to play this game a lot with my mom, so when I played the game for the first time in many years, I made sure to unplug my headphones and turn the volume up so she could hear the game, just to see if she would recognize it. And she immediately did. This is the same woman, by the way, that only a month ago asked if my N64 was a PlayStation. I remember years after we stopped playing this game, she was talking to either a family member or one of her friends, and for whatever reason, this game came up, and she said that it was the best game she had ever played. Which I mean... Yeah, I can kind of see where she was coming from. I know she liked a lot of Pac-Man back in the day and Sonic, so if you compare those games... You know, just from a presentation standpoint, this game seems... Way better for the time, you know? Again, the game was really good at masquerading its simplicity. So, you know, it... At the time, it seemed like a pretty epic game. Nowadays, its flaws kind of shine through just a little bit. And I honestly think the average person would probably just skip this game, wouldn't find it very engaging, unfortunately. But as I mentioned a whole bunch of times during this review, I have, I have too many good memories uh, with this game. That being said, though, replaying this game does make me a little sad uh, because some of the stuff that I used to perceive as way better aren't. <laughs> The Quidditch matches are, are, are done like that. I remember taking a long time on those matches as a kid. But uh, when I restarted playing this game last year, uh, I found out, oh no, they're, they're, they're done real quick. If you know what you're doing. If you have a functioning brain. That and especially the last part of the game uh, with all the, the stuff defending the, the stone and the final boss battle even. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just real simple stuff. Just real straightforward, just... Bada bing, bada boom, we're done, it's over. Uh, which does kinda, does kinda bum me out, to, to be completely honest. That being said though, there are still a lot of good stuff about this game. Like I mentioned, the music, it's amazing. Editing this video is gonna be fun. I will say that the spell effects, they still look pretty good. I really like at the end, when you kill Vol when you kill Voldemort. It still looks nice, and like, I like looking at this. It's, there's still a lot of good texture work and lighting. It, it's, it's nice to look at, honestly. It's better to look at than even some of the future games that would come out later. Because those are very flat. And even though the graphics are better, they don't look as good. I also find this line at the end very heartwarming. I, it just makes me happy. It was the best evening of Harry's life. Better than winning at Quidditch or Christmas or knocking out mountain trolls. He would never, ever forget tonight. I remember it took me a very long time to actually get to the ending uh, for when I first played this game. But you can beat this game in one sitting really if you know what you're doing. So This also, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, this is like one of the last gifts my grandfather gave me before he passed away. So I'm always going to like it at least for that. Yeah. The other thing he gave me was the Spongebob game. And I think he gave me a third game, but I can't remember which one it was. Maybe, I'm, maybe it was music? Maybe it was like a CD or something? I don't know. I don't remember. But enough of, of sad stuff. Rejoice, because we still have another game to play in this series. Because yes, a sequel was made. More like a sequel to the movie was made. And uh, you need a game adaptation, so yeah. But it is kind of like an actual sequel, because it's, it's in the same style as this game, which is good. I haven't played it. I came very close to owning it as a child. Um... If I would have begged my father a little bit more, if I maybe would have insisted that I want this just a little bit more, uh, I might have got it, but uh, I didn't do it. And I only saw it one time in the Target or Walmart where we were at, so I never got another chance to get it. But, uh, you know, it's abandonware, so there's ways of getting 
stuff. So I'm excited. I'm going to be playing it today as this review is released, so that's going to be kind of cool. I already played a demo. I found two demos, uh, and I played them very briefly, and I gotta say, I'm excited. Now that being said though, I have been excited for other games that were sequels to games that I played in my youth and uh, turned out not to be the best games. But we haven't reviewed that game yet, so you know, we don't need to think about that yet. Yeah, so uh, next time in the Harry Potter universe, we'll be playing the second game. Thank you all for watching, hope you all enjoyed. Leave a comment. Leave a comment. It's my birthday today as this is premiering. Is anybody watching? I hope so. Le leave a comment. What's your favorite Harry Potter? Is it this one? What's your favorite bean? That's a good qu What's your favorite bean? My, mine is the striped one. Uh, yeah, I like that one. It looks nice. Are you guys more of a, a fan of the blue one? Is there a blue one? I don't even remember. I hit the lights. Peace out. Leave a comment, by the way. Did I mention that? If I have, then maybe you should leave one. Because that'd be pretty cool. Do you like my glasses? I've had these since I was like... Maybe seven, eight. And they, they like kind of fit, which is weird. How big were these on my face when I was a little kid? Anyways, peace out.